welcome to all of you to this session on economic survey as everyone was waiting for the economic survey to release and finally the document has been released and it has been put in the public domain so first of all why economic survey what is the relevance of economic survey so let me tell you if there is only one book which can take you towards the upsc qualification then it is only the economic survey because economic survey discusses everything what is happening in the economy and not only about what is happening in the economy but it also tells what is the future for the indian economy be its gdp be its inflation be its forex reserves everything has been discussed in the economic survey although it is a voluminous book it's approximately 500 pages but still the book is highly intellectual because all the professional all the highly expertise economists of india and also the global have their role to play in preparation of the indian economic survey and let me tell you the historical context since 1950s this document is published annually annually without any break this survey has been published and once you read the survey you get the entire gist of what is happening in the indian economy right so first of all let's do the basics who releases it it is released by the department of economic affairs see ministry of finance under the government of india has many departments and one of the department is department of economic affairs which prepares this report under the guidance of chief economic advisor so chief economic advisor is the central person who is responsible to document this intellectual book what it happens what it includes so it includes the growth outlook for the past year that is for fy23 that means from 2022 to 2023 how the economy has performed and also it projects how the economy is going to perform in the next coming financial year that is from 2023 to 2024 and it is generally released a day before the budget is released so budget is released generally on 1st feb and then the survey is put into public domain by 31st of january right so first we'll understand what the economic survey has to tell about gdp see gdp is the most important parameter to gauge the status of indian economy every country releases its gdp data and on that data we compare how the economy is performing right so the survey projects that the gdp growth rate to be 6 to 6.8% in 2023 to 2024 but there's a big disclaimer which the survey has put that this will depend upon the global political and economic situation you know that if you analyze the world the past 2 to 3 years has been a world where multiple events which no one has predicted has happened be it the geopolitical crisis of russia ukraine war be it the coming geo economic crisis because of the black swan event pandemic so all these situations has cumulatively acted as a big dent on the whole humanity so the survey says that this whole gdp growth rate will depend upon how the future is with respect to political and economical development globally but despite all of these things see 6% is not very much right india have was already growing with 7 8% it has been growing growing with that particular number in the past but despite all the uncertainties india will still manage to get a growth rate of 6 to 6.8% and that is incredible we'll see why but the survey says that india will remain the fastest major growing economy in the world despite of all the odds india will still be the leading nation in terms of the gdp growth and lastly the survey with respect to gdp summarizes the entire thing it says that economy has nearly recouped what was lost we'll see how renewed what had paused and reenergized what was slowing during the pandemic and since the conflict in europe let me illustrate this whole summary by some figures so you can see first of all the first figure tells you what is the gdp growth rate so you can see in the fy20 that is from 2019 to 2020 the gdp was 3.7 and then came the pandemic and india entered 
along with other countries into a period of recession where the economy declined or the contracted by 6.6% in the history of when India got independent only for five times our economy has contracted and this happened during the 2020 to 2021. But after that India bounced back, the GDP growth rate was 8.7% and for this financial year that is from 2022 to 2023 the GDP is predicted to be at 7%. And for the coming year, that is from 2023 to 2024, the GDP is estimated to grow at 6 to 6.8 percent. Now, see, this diagram basically tells. So, we started from here, then came the pandemic, and in the pandemic, we declined. Our economy declined. But see, then in the next year, we are again back to where we started. That means India has recovered all the things which we have lost. So all the GDP which was lost during the pandemic, now India in the FY 2022 has recovered all that was lost. And in the next financial year, you can see that India is growing strongly despite all the odds. So the survey says in short that the GDP which declined during the pandemic and the recovery of that loss has completed. So that's a very good news which the survey tells. Now, what I was saying that the world is facing a lot of crisis. And when the world is facing a lot of crisis, most of the global economies, most of the global economies, be it the best advanced economies of the best, all are moving towards a recession, all are moving towards a slowdown. In every country, there's a huge uncertainty as to how their future will be. And in all these things, India is still emerging as a strong player. This you can see in this particular diagram. The United States is projected to grow at 1.6% and in the next year at 1%. You can see United Kingdom lowing to 3.0.3%. Then you can see China 4.4%. But see India at 6.1% and for 2020 to 6.8%. So you can analyze that India is the fastest major growing economy in the world. So we were discussing why India is going to be the fastest major growing economy in the world. So the survey tries to put out some basic substantial proof that why India will be the leading country in terms of GDP growth. So the first survey says that there is a huge rebound of private consumption. What do you mean by private consumption? So private consumption is basically a consumption which is made by people like you and me. What we do? We go, we buy car, we buy phones, we buy laptop, we go and eat food. So all these consumptions is the major strength of Indian economy. Let me tell you, India's GDP ka approximately 55 to 60 percent of our GDP growth rate comes from this private consumption. And this private consumption was declining. Because of pandemic, a lot of people were jobless. A lot of people whose salary was going to increase, it did not did. So in this context, the private consumption, which constitutes 55 to 60 percent of GDP was in decline, but the survey says that it is now rebouncing in a very strong manner. Second, the survey says that you know that India always used to give subsidies. India always used to give some freebies culture. There was a freebie culture which was promoted, but since two to three years, this government has focused in a very strong manner in terms of capital expenditure. Capital expenditure means construction of road, railways, highways, all those infrastructures which has a multiplier effect because if you construct a road then the economy gains by double but if you give freebies if you give subsidies there is no productivity which is comes to the economy so that is why the survey says that the quality of expenditure done by government is shifting more towards capex and less towards the freebies or the subsidies and because of this huge push towards capital expenditure the private players which were reluctant to invest in India now they are feeling confident that yes government is standing government is spending in the right manner so let us also support the government so because of the qualitative shift in terms of where and how the government is spending the private persons are also coming into the picture and they are also investing the third near universal vaccination coverage. You know that India has the record number of vaccination in the shortest period of time. And because of that, the contacts based services, what do you mean by contact based services like hospitality, se hospitality sector, hotels, tourism, spa. So this is again a very important sector for the Indian economy, right? And because in the pandemic, the tourism was shut, all the services which were based on human to human contact, 
were shut. But now, because of the near universal vaccination coverage, the services industry is also growing at a very great pace. Fourth, the survey says that all those migrant workers, because of the lockdown, where they went back to the villages, now they have again came back to the urban cities. So all those construction sector, where there was a huge shortfall of migrant workers, now it is not the case. Finally, very important thing the survey says that there's no twin bill balance sheet problem. You know that since 2015 or in the 2015, India was facing this very big problem. What do you mean by no twin balance sheet? It basically says that the balance sheet of the corporate and the balance sheet of the public sector banks, both are in a very poor state. Both are in a very poor state. Let me give you an example. For example, I am a company. I have taken 100 crore of loan, but I'm not able to repay that loan back. So my balance sheet is, has gone and the bank which has given me the loan, now uska bhi balance sheet has gone, right? So both the balance sheet gets disturbed. So this problem India was facing in 2015, but due to many different different steps which has been taken by government, now there is a Tata bye bye to this twin balance sheet problem. India has now a very robust public sector banks and also the state of the corporates which were highly over leveraged at one point of time their balance sheet has also consolidated, right? So now India does not have any twin balance sheet problem. So in all this context, the survey says that everything sounds very optimistic for India. And hence India, after the pandemic or after the this war, when the things will settle down, India will emerge in a much more stronger manner than anyone has expected. Now, inflation. Again, inflation is a very important parameter to gauge and understand how the economy is. Because you know that inflation does not affect the rich. Inflation does not affect the rich. But what is inflation? Inflation basically is like a tax on the poor. Because by inflation, most of the things becomes out of reach for the poor population. For example, if the prices of onion increases, how can a poor person afford that? So that is why inflation is again a very important parameter. And survey says that the RBI has projected the headline inflation at 6.8%. You already know that in terms of inflation, India has kept a tolerance limit. That is, in India, the inflation has to be from 2% to 6%. And if it is beyond 6%, then that means that inflation has failed or inflation is not as per what the government wants to be. So, but because of the pandemic, when the supply chain was disrupted, because of the geopolitical uncertainty because of Russia Ukraine war and the energy prices being shot up in all these contexts, not only India, but globally, every country is facing high level of inflation. You can see this graph. So this particular graph is for advanced economy. 7.2 is the average inflation which these countries are facing. You know that US and every country has a high level of inflation. And then similarly, the developing countries also has a high level of inflation. But despite all these things, India was able to keep the inflation beyond a particular level. That means although it is more than 6%, but still it has not exceeded too much as everyone was predicting that in India economy will might even go to double digit. So although the inflation is beyond what the tolerance limit of 6% is, but still the inflation has not uh, been out of reach. This is because the survey says this is because you know that in India, who is responsible to control the inflation? It is the primary responsibility of the RBI. And in RBI also, there's a monetary policy committee, which is constituted only for this purpose that they have to control or they have to keep the level of inflation from two to 6%. So the work done by the RBI monetary committee was incredible. And hence the Indian inflation did not went out of reach. So you can see that this is a graph that how interest rates were increased. You know that when inflation rises, the interest rate has also to increase. Why? Because interest is what? Interest rate basically tells you at what cost you can borrow the money. So if the inflation is high, that means the supply of money exceeds than what is required. So in that case, generally, the central bank increases the interest rate so that the cost of borrowing increases. So if the cost of borrowing increases, then less people will uh, uh, go and take the loans. And if the less people will go and take the loan, then the supply of the money will reduce. And hence, the inflation will also come down. Right. To do that, RBI has been constantly or RBI Monetary Policy Committee has been constantly increasing the interest rate. In terms of economy, we call it as a repo rate. 
right? So repo rate has been constantly increasing. So you can see in 8 April 2022, it was at 4%. And finally, in the last month, 7 December, last to last month, the interest rate or the repo rate has increased to 6.5%. And because of this calibrated increase, in a very step-by-step -step manner, our inflation has not crossed what other countries are facing. Because if you compare Sri Lanka, if you compare Pakistan, if you compare Turkey, all those countries are facing double digit of inflation. So in that context, our inflation is hovering around 7%, 8% at the max. Now, fiscal deficit, again, a very important parameter to gauge the status of economy. What do you mean by fiscal deficit? You know that governments, what the government gets and the, what the government spends, there's a complete mismatch. So suppose government gets 100 and government has to spend 200. That means government is facing a deficit of 100 rupees. So that is known as fiscal deficit. That is known as fiscal deficit. So fiscal deficit is also a very important parameter because if government recklessly takes loan, if government recklessly spends a lot of money, then the economy, the macroeconomic stability of the economy, come, the stability of the economy comes into problem, right? So you can see that the fiscal deficit, right? It was in FY20, 9.2. Now it has come down to 6.4. You know that our target is to achieve a fiscal deficit of 4.5% by 25-26. So in that context, the fiscal deficit is again on the declining trend. It is on again on the declining trend. Because if the government, why there's a limit? There's a limit because you have to control what the government spends. Because if you don't have any limit or if you don't have any plan, then government can borrow any amount of money. And hence, because of, if government borrows a lot of money and spends recklessly, then the inflation will rise. And hence, the stability of the country comes into crisis. And similarly, the fiscal deficit of the state, you can see it's 3.4%. Right. So for the center, it is on the declining trend and for the state also, it is around 3 to 4 percent the fiscal deficit. Now comes to the tax collection. So tax collection, the graph has been put by the economic survey. Right. So for the FY23, you can see that out of 100 rupees, which the government gets, 28 comes from the GST, 26 comes from the corporate income tax, 26 comes from the personal income tax, 26 comes from the excise duty and 8 percent comes from the customs. So you can see that GST which was a game changer tax based revolution now has very much stabilized. So the unpredictability which was with GST now has gone and the GST has emerged as a very stable tax. So you can see that there has been a robust increase in terms of GST collection. Now, if we do the sectoral growth trends, how different different sectors of the economy are performing. You know that there are three sectors. One is the agriculture, second is the industrial and the third one is services. If we compare all the three sectors, let us see which sector has performed well and which sector has not performed well. So as per the survey, the agriculture sector has been the most resilient sector in the entire pandemic or in the entire game of the picture. You can see that it grew, it grew also during the pandemic. So during the pandemic, it grew at 3.3%. You know, you can see the industry minus 3.3%. You can see the services minus 7.7, minus 7.8. But despite all the sector showing a recession, the agriculture sector was very strong and it was very resilient sector. So you can see that agriculture sector is expected to grow at 3.5%. The government target is 4%. So it is close to that 3.5%. If you see the industrial sector, this is where the problem is. You know that India manufacturing is very much poor as compared to other countries. But our services sector is very good. Services ka matlab hota hai, you know, services that means tourism, services that means software. So like companies like TCS, Wipro. So India has a very good services sector. But when, when it comes to industrial sector or the manufacturing sector, India is not that good. So we can see that industrial growth shattered during the pandemic. It was at minus 3.3. But let me tell you that during the 2018-19, before the pandemic also, industrial growth rate was in the negative figure. So things are not going good in terms of industrial growth, but services sector, although it contracted during the pandemic, but now you can see it is growing in a very fast manner. So overall, if you see the agriculture sector is performing good, industrial sector is performing optimum as usual, always it happens, but the service sector is the key sector which is taking fastly the India's growth story. Then comes the goods trade outlook, goods merchandise trade outlook. So you know that India, generally India imports more goods than what it exports. Okay? India imports more goods than what it exports. Why? Because in India, the manufacturing has not been developed 
that significantly as you can see in other countries, for example, like China. So generally in India, most of the goods, you can see laptop, phone, car, everything is imported from outside, right? So that is why India has a trade deficit. Trade deficit means the amount which we get through export and the amount which we have to spend to get our import is always higher. So always the import value is higher than the export value and hence we run a deficit. So see, you can see the deficit. Deficit minus 60.2 billion dollar, 54.6 billion dollar, 62, 81 billion dollar and 75 billion dollar. So 75 billion dollar ka deficit hai. So this dollar deficit basically depletes our forex reserve. This dollar deficit basically depletes our forex reserve. And for country like China, they have a trade balance and India has a trade deficit in terms of goods. But when you compare the services sector, this is the sector which has performed or which has been performing very appropriately, very up to the mark. And that is why Indian services sector is always having a trade balance. That means we export more than what we import. And that is why India always earns dollar because any international transaction has to happen in dollar. So if we are sending a good, then we are getting dollar. And if we are buying a good, we have to sell dollar. We have to spend dollar. So because we export more than what we import, so you can see that in, in India, services sector is always positive. And you can see that survey says that in the, this year also, the trend will remain the same and we will be earning huge forex reserve because of the positive trade balance in the services sector. And that is why, because we earn dollars over here, so this dollar we are using to fund the deficit which we are facing in the merchandise goods, right? Now, there is one big problem with the services. Although the problem is not that much, but the survey says that because of the geopolitical uncertainty, because of the uh, you know geoeconomic crisis which the world is facing, things might turn the other way when it comes to the current account deficit. You know that when we prepare the scheme of balance of payments, so there are two accounts. One is the capital account and the other one is the current account. What do you mean by capital account? Capital account is basically the flow of FDI, FPI and other things. And what do you mean by current account? Basically the trades and goods and services. So generally, if you compare the current account, it is always deficit because the value of things which we export, all the goods and services combined, the amount which we export and the amount which we import. So the import value is much more higher. We have already seen this. You can see that in terms of goods trade, we are negative, but in terms of services trade, we are positive. But when you add this negative positive, we comes in a net negative, but still we are net negative. And that is why our current account deficit, which includes mostly the trades in goods and services apart from other things also. So trades and services, if you combine both the things, still we are negative. So generally the current account deficit was hovering around 1-2%, but this quarter, the last quarter, it came down to 4.4%. And this is a very worrying sign because you know, generally if the CAD current account deficit is, with, is from 3 to 4%, it's fine. But when it crosses that 4%, then the thing starts to become problematic. And you know that why? You know, because we have to get the oil imported and because of the Russia-Ukraine ball, the energy prices are shot up. So in that case, our import cost rises. Second, global commodity. You know that inflation is a global phenomena. Every country is facing inflation. So in that context, the global commodity prices is also on a rise. And third, whenever the current account deficit increases, the rupee starts to depreciate. The rupee starts to depreciate. And that is why you will always hear in news that rupee has touched it all time low at all time high. So this is the reason whenever the current account deficit bidens, the rupee straight away comes under the attack. But the survey says that although it is a worrying thing, but that does not mean that India is going to face a very severe crisis because you know that what is current account deficit? It is a deficit. That means we are going how much dollar we are getting and how much dollar we are using to buy the imported goods. So when you export, you earn dollar and when you import, you use your dollar. Because of the deficit, we spend more dollar. But from where we will get that extra dollar, we will be getting that dollar from our forex reserves. India has a good forex reserve. So because India has a good forex reserves, then that is why despite the CAD, despite the current account deficit reaching to its all time low, still because the forex is so good, that is why we are able or we are confident that there will be not a big problem. So you can see that this graph basically tells you the forex reserve. So quarter three in the FY23, the forex is approximately 563 billion dollars so that's a huge number right so that is why india does not have a very big problem because india can use the dollar reserves from here to fund its current account deficit okay and this graph basically tells you the import cover so currently import is import cover import cover is basically even if we don't do any trade 
and the reserves which you have. So how long you can get the things imported with the same reserve which you have. So for example, if India has 563 billion dollar and if we don't earn any dollar from tomorrow, so till how long we can get the things imported what we are importing. So for 8 to 10 months, for 10 months we can still get the things imported. You know that during 1991, when India had a balance of payment crisis. So this is what was happening. India was left with no dollar reserves. So that is why India was not able to import anything, right? So forex reserve is that's why very crucial because you know that India is a highly dependent on the import of oil. And when we don't have dollar from where we are going to import the oil. So that is why the survey says that although the current account deficit is going to be a problem, but still we have a huge big uh, forex reserve and also the import cover is for approximately 10 months. So that is good. Coming to climate change, one of the new imagination discourse which the world is seeing, climate change, it is a new reality. And India, you know that despite India being a developing country and India's contribution to this whole climate injustice or the whole climate catastrophe is very less, but India has been a leading player in terms of climate uh, climate-led activism. So you can see that how India has progressed. So the survey tries to sell that how India is performing in terms of its climate activism. So you can see that we started with National Action Plan on Climate Change. We went to the COP27 where we renewed our NDCs. You know that Panchamitra, where Prime Minister has given five major goals. One of the goals is that India will become net zero by 2070, right? Then share of renewables energy has increased out of the total electricity and then finally you see that this year also sorry last year the government has launched this flagship scheme that is known as national green hydrogen mission and this year we have launched this sovereign green bond right so the survey says that india has performed more than what it needs to when it comes to climate activism next come to unemployment so unemployment you know that this is again a very big issue for india india is generally called as a jobless growth or india has generally said that india is not uh, uh, you know generating much more uh, jobs but but the survey says that this is not the case survey says that if you see the unemployment rate so in 2018-19 the unemployment rate was 5.8 percent but next year it is 4.8 percent and then the another next year it is 4.2 percent that means our unemployment is on decline our unemployment is on decline. Similarly, you know, labor force participation ratio. What do you mean by labor force participation ratio? It is that how many people are either in the job or plus how many people who are looking for job, right? So that means how many people are participating in the economy. So that is also on rise. So you can see that 55.6% of the people were doing then 56.8 and then 57.5. So overall, the survey says that although the unemployment you know, shot up during the pandemic. But now, once the pandemic, when the dust has settled, India's labor force participation and India's labor market has recovered what was before the pandemic. Finally, you know that social infrastructure is also very important. India being a welfare state, it is very crucial that the economic pie, if it increases, then it is redistributed among the poor people also. And going by that principle, think sabka saath, sabka vikas, the government has allocated a huge fund towards the social infrastructure and you can see that it was 25.2 lakh crore and now it has increased to 26.6 lakhs 6 lakh crore so that's that mean that government is spending a huge amount of expenditure also on the social infrastructure that means health education and other schemes finally the survey concludes that you know that india is entering the period of amrit kal it started last year and by 2047, Indian have taken a pledge that we are going to be a developed economy. So in that context, the survey says that the fundamentals of Indian economy are sound as it enters the Amrit Kal, the 25 year journey towards the centenary as a modern independent nation. Right. So Amrit Kal is a very important period and the survey also sell, also tells that this Amrit Kal will not only a growth story for India, but India will also act as a moral voice for the developing world. And in that context, the survey categorically puts that how India is going to look and how India is going to shape the world in, the, in, it, in its period of Amrit Kal by saying that we, we consider our growth as based on the principle of Vasudev Kutumbukam, that is one earth, one family and one shared humanity. So in that context, the survey says that although India will be developing, India will be growing much faster and India will become a developed country by 2047. But this growth will not only be for India, but this growth, it will be for the entire humanity. The growth will be based 
on moral principles of equality the growth will be based on the principle of inclusion and the growth will try to deliver the objective or to deliver the crisis which the whole humanity is facing so the economic survey concludes everything in a much more optimistic note and it says that Indian fundamental economic principles are very strong and India is bound to grow. India is bound to grow despite anything happen. India might be declining to some extent, but no one can stop the rise of India because all our economic fundamentals are in a very strong place. And this growth, the survey says, is not only for India, but this growth will help the humanity to be a better place. So I hope that this survey you get a brief introductions, but this, let me tell you, my friends, this is only an introduction. There will be a huge detailed analysis, in-depth analysis, both from the prelims perspective, both from the mains perspective for interview and in general. So everything, everything will be explained to you in as simple manner as it can be so that the economic survey and the coming budget you are very much familiar with and you don't commit any mistake in the exam. So you have to wait for some time and the detailed analysis is just right on the way to you in the coming days. Continue watching us. Thank you. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe to our channel and press the bell icon to never miss an update.